Hello everyone and welcome to today's event, Motivational Interviewing, a Technique for Your Practice, our interview with Buck Black. Um, Buck, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Mm, it's lovely to have you and um, thanks also to everyone who's joining us online. It's great to have you here. Um, Buck and I are also in the chat room, so although we can see and hear each other, can't see and hear the audience, so if you want to um, pop any questions in the chat room, we'll be watching that and hopefully have a, a really interactive experience today. I guess we're ho both hoping for that, aren't we, Buck? Absolutely. I, I love to have questions. Mm. Great, great. So, well, maybe the first question I can ask you, um, because we're all online, we're in a bit of a virtual space here. Whereabouts in the world are you located, Buck? Well, I'm in the United States, about two hours south of Chicago. Mm. Wow. And um, you were saying the weather today has been quite nice, actually. It's very nice, very sunny and warm. Yes, probably, probably not too many of those days left before winter comes. Mm. So you're savoring them, I guess. Yeah. And after the interview, I'm going to get out and enjoy this, yes. Mm. Sounds lovely. Sounds good. Well, uh, today I'm in Sheffield, um, so that's a, a more unusual place for the online events team. And of course, Saz is in Scotland. And also in the chat room, and able to help anyone with technical difficulties or to put their questions to us. Um, so, Buck, in terms of the interview, maybe I could start with asking you about motivational interviewing. That's what we're here to talk about. And... Um, ask you to say a little bit about how you got into motivational interviewing. Why, why do you use it now, I guess? Oh, absolutely. Um, motivational interviewing is something that, that we generally think of when it is related to substance abuse. Mm. Um, essentially, what it is, is it's, it's more of a technique. Um, it's more of a philosophy of how one does therapy instead of any kind of specific uh, recipe or formula as, as, as something like CBT or REBT. It's not like that. It's more of a philosophy. And essentially what it is, is you let the client decide for themselves if they want to work on the, work on the problem that they're coming in for. Mm -hmm. So you help them build their internal motivation. And if they don't see it as a problem, then it's not a problem. So I began this work in substance abuse areas when I did these substance abuse groups, and it worked so well that I brought it into my private practice where I focus on anger management, couples, anxiety, and so on. So you can generalize it to, to many areas of counseling. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like you work with some substance abuse groups. That's where you develop the... Motivational yes. interviewing. Um, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And you've also seen the benefits in more genetic counseling settings, relationships. Mm. I definitely have, yes. Yeah. And uh, I know that we've titled the, the event tonight, Is It a Technique for Your Practice? But right away you're saying, well, it's more of a philosophy, a way of thinking? Yes, yeah. And... Um, just essentially, it's something that needs to be throughout. You don't say to yourself as a therapist, okay, I'm going to use motivational interviewing for the next 10 minutes of the session. It's something that you do throughout. And any kind of telephone context with your, with your clients and what have you, you want to continue that same philosophy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a whole way of being throughout therapy. It definitely is, yes, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the philosophy, just in terms of what is it that would run all the way through therapy? Absolutely. Um, first of all, is the philosophy is you respect the client's free will. So when someone is coming through your door, maybe they have a problem that they want to change and they've already made that decision. This is what I want to work on. Or maybe they're court-ordered. Or maybe their spouse tells them that they have to come to therapy and work on this. So essentially, they are not wanting to work on this, but they're coming into your office because there's been some pressure. So 
I want to avoid being the expert and saying, okay, you need to work on this. You, you, you look at the client and you say, okay, what would you like to change? What would you like to work on? Do you see anything as a problem? And they're able to name either something that they need to work on or the fact that maybe say it was drunk driving and they're saying, well, I got arrested for drunk driving, but I don't have a problem. You know, it was just bad luck. They just caught me at the wrong time. And you let them decide where they're at. So if I could do just a little bit of framework so this makes a little bit more sense. That'd be great. Fun. Is we, we look at the stages of change for the client. Okay. So a person walking into your office is, is maybe in one of these different stages of change. So we'll start out looking at pre-contemplation. So pre-contemplation is saying, I don't have a problem at all. So if we look at the drunk driving, for instance, it's, okay, yes, they, they arrested me, but you know what? They have to meet the quota, and I was just over by one beer, and it was a special occasion. I don't have a problem at all. I didn't do anything wrong. Okay, so that's, that would be the, um, the pre-contemplation. The contemplation uh, client would be, well, you know what? I have been arrested a time or two. I, I can see the problems with, with the legalities of it, but I don't see the problem. Um, but, I, but I'm really not sure if it's truly a problem for myself. It's a problem for other people, but it's not a problem for myself. Okay? So, so that's the contemplation, back and forth. So if you look at preparation, that is the client saying, okay, you know what? I think that there is a problem here. I'm starting to get tired of being arrested for drunk driving. However, I'm really not so sure what to do about it. So this is when the client is starting to really become open for any kind of um, suggestion from the therapist of how to handle this. So that's the preparation. The action stage is, yes, I'm tired of, of being arrested for drunk driving, I'm tired of the family problems, and I want to do everything I can possible in order to change myself. So that's action. That's where the true therapy takes place. And then the last stage is maintenance. So the maintenance, um, we typically look at that, in, in the U.S. at least, we call it aftercare. So therapy has pretty much been completed. And then maybe they're coming back into the office once, uh, once a month, once every two weeks, something like that, just to follow up. Are you doing everything that you need to do? Are you following a relapse prevention plan? Are you maintaining contacts with appropriate people? Are you slipping up? You know, something like that. Well, it's really great to get a sense of that framework, the different stages from someone who's not, contemplating what they're doing at all isn't going there exactly. all the way through to the aftercare yeah yes yes mm. yeah great so that there's I'm, I'm imagining that helps you make some kind of assessment about where the client is as well at the start of therapy exactly because you need to match your therapy with where the client is so if you have a client that is in, in contemplation stage, let's say it's, if it's with anger management, and, you know, yes, I, I get into an argument with my spouse every day, I see it as a problem, but I'm really not sure if it's something that I need to, to work on personally. Mm. If that's where they're at, and, and I'm saying, okay, here's an anger management workbook, and let me tell you all these ways to control your anger, they're going to be saying, whoa, back up here, I, I, I don't know about this. Uh, this, this seems pushy. Yeah. So it's really important to locate them in the right place of the framework, I guess. And to exactly. What you offer them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So that, and it, as they move through that framework, I guess their free will is a big part of the philosophy, the approach. It definitely is, because um, I, as a therapist, I.